Welcome to an update on the security flaw of the Yale Y150-40 four-wheel combination padlock. In the last video I showed you a decoding method that does not require to pull on the shackle, but only to move the wheels up and down. The first wheel is in a true gate and it's really loose. Second wheel is in no gate, it's really springy. Third wheel is in a false gate, it's also springy, I can feel it very well, but it's not that obvious. Uh, this method is really easy to conduct and really reliable, but it's not common across different combination padlocks. For example, you cannot use it on the Bergwächter four-wheel combination padlock. Um, I have the same gate situation here. First wheel is in a true gate. You can see it's kind of springy. Second wheel is in no gate, it's also springy. Third wheel is in a false gate. It's also a little bit springy. So there is not much difference here um, across the wheels. And so I want to take both locks apart and compare the internals. I've taken apart the Burgwächter before and it's easy for me to do it again. For the Yale I don't know yet, but I will go downstairs and try my best and we'll be back uh, very soon with uh, a lot of different parts. So stay tuned. <laughs> So here's the Yale four-wheel combination padlock taken apart. We have the lock body, the four outer wheels with the numbers on it, the shackle with the inner wheels with the T's on it, and we have the end cap that was sitting on top of it and held everything together. First let's closely inspect the lock body. We can see when we look inside the chamber the gates here is the true gate that is wide enough for the T's to slide through and here are the four false gates which are not wide enough but um, are designed to catch the teeth and to make it harder to decode the lock. Additionally we have spring-loaded barbarians that cause these wheels to click and to stop at every whole number. So these are designed to catch here on these uh, separation lines. In order to understand the wiggling method I want to quickly reassemble the lock with one wheel so we can uh, see the method working. So here's the lock partially reassembled. I inserted the outer wheel on position 1 and no outer wheels on the remaining positions so that we can see the inner wheels here uh, with the teeth. The method that can be used on this lock to detect the, um, the true gates um, by wiggling left and right is actually not a method for directly detecting the gates but it's an indirect method. You can see that the teeth of the inner wheels in the state where the shackle is pushed inwards do not interact with the gates at all. So the method cannot directly detect the gates but it can detect the position of the teeth. So it detects that the position of the teeth is next to the uh, spring-loaded barbarian. That's what you detect. And this position, coincidentally, is exactly the position of the true gate. So how does this look like when we look here from the top? So here we can see the true gate and the tooth of the first inner wheel underneath. It's not in the true gate itself, as you can see from the position of the other teeth. It's in this empty space in between. So now when I turn or when I move the outer wheel left and right, I hold the shackle still, you can see that it's kind of loose. And that's because the spring underneath here pushes against the outer wheel and therewith pushes against the tooth of the first inner wheel and that gives the symmetric feedback left and right and no springiness when we move it left and right but of course springiness when we push on it. 
So, in this state, the spring pushes against the tooth of the inner wheel and therewith the outer wheel kind of pivots left and right from this position. When we now turn the wheel a couple of times to change the position of the inner wheel's tooth, we can see that it's now no longer symmetric. It has a direction depending on the position of the inner wheel's tooth and this gives the opportunity to detect the position of the inner wheel's tooth and if we have the loose feedback again like so we know that the tooth of the inner wheel is at the bottom position next to the spring where the spring pushes against the outer wheel and lets the outer wheel pivot against this uh, rotation point. So that's the explanation but why does this not apply to the Burgwächter lock? So here is the Yale and the Burgwächter four-wheel combination padlock both for a direct comparison. All the components and the way these locks are built are very similar with some little details that differ. <laughs> for example, when we look in the chamber of the Burgwächter lock, we can again recognize the true gate, which is a little bit wider here on the left, and four false gates around. When we look at the shackles, left is the one from the Yale. It has a little bit wider or larger uh, inner wheels in diameter, but smaller teeth. Here is the shackle from the Burgwächter. Smaller in diameter, but longer teeth. And here are the outer wheels. They also look very similar. But when we look carefully in the way the inner wheel and the outer wheel interacts, we can see a remarkable difference which makes all the difference in the question if a lock can be decoded with a shown method or not. The cutouts on the outer wheel are very shallow and the tooth of the inner wheel is long enough so that it makes contact at this surface area. And now the spring underneath here pushes against the outer wheel and therewith the outer wheel can pivot around the position of the inner wheel that makes contact with the surface of the cutout and that's the way how the movement of the outer wheel can be used to detect the position of the inner wheel's uh, tooth. On the Burgwächter lock the situation is different. We can see the cutouts on the outer wheel are much deeper and when I fit both together we can see the following. When I push the outer wheel upwards simulating the spring there is still a little bit of space left here. That means that the wheel cannot pivot around the end of the inner wheel's tooth and therefore the feedback that we can derive from the movement of the outer wheel like on the Yale is not present here. So here the teeth of the or the spikes of the outer wheel are pushed against the surface of the inner wheel and this is all the way around the same and there is no preference not in the way the tooth of the inner wheel would provide when it make, makes contact uh, to the end of this uh, surface here. So that's the reason why the Burgwächter lock is not susceptible for this wiggling attack but the Yale is. So it took me 
quite a while to figure out um, how this actually works, but it was great fun. Yeah, that was the explanation of the wiggling method, how it works and when a lock is susceptible to this kind of attack. Yeah, um, I hope you found this interesting and um, until we meet again, thanks for watching, happy picking and bye bye! <laughs>